Hey guys, it's Daniel. The following is a clip from my interview with Soundgarden producer Michael Beinhorn. If you want to see the full interview, it's linked below. Earlier we spoke about your electronic music approach, so to speak, when it came to recording the record, producing the record. Kim has said that Super Unknown, in his opinion, is the perfect headphones record. Like, it's the great soundscape. What exactly did you do on a technical level to get the soundscape for that record? I wanted to make sure that instead of having these like dum 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 type bass sounds, yeah, or, yeah. or I should say more clang 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 bass sounds, <laughs> that we had something that might have had a little top to it, but also had a lot like a round like to it, like that mm -hmm. that was powerful and deep. You know, so I really I, I wanted to get actually some dub in there <laughs> yeah, yeah. as well. You know, because it's so unrewarding to hear a bassist hit a sustained note and have it go boom. You yeah, know, know where's saying. the boom, you know, mm -hmm. you want the note to hang. And if we hadn't taken the time with that sound, those long notes on Black Hole Sun, for example, it wouldn't have been there. You know, Brendan would have had to fiddle with a compressor when he mixed to try and get them to come up more if that was even something that was relevant. But, you know, man, those those notes really had to they had to linger for a long time. No, for sure. Um you know, so basically I did, we did a lot of stuff like that, you know, with the guitars, it was the same thing, like trying to find the right coloration to sit with the bass. Cause I didn't want to have a guitar sound that everyone else had. I wanted to get something else, something that was unique. Unfortunately, Chris is using very different guitars for rhythm. Mm -hmm. So that helped. And we had a, we had a great rig and we wound up getting some really great guitar sounds. Did you do a lot you know? of layering so, afterwards? Uh, a lot of layering on that one. On like on guitars and vocals, like was there a lot of layering for that record or how did you approach that part of it? Not much. I mean, for the guitars, for the, for the, for the main rhythm stuff, it was usually just a pair, mm -hmm. one pair. That was it. I, I, I felt that the rhythm section aspect of this record had to be very, very, had to stand away from the pack. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, a lot of that was because I, I felt that rock records had kind of deviated towards this um, this really kind of thin sound where you got some attack out of the drums, but you didn't get a whole bunch of low end and depth and the same. And the bass was kind of thought of as a kind of like an it was like an afterthought, which, yeah. you know, if you listen to records from like the 60s and 70s, bass is out front because, you know, we're only a couple of years away from R&B records, mm -hmm. you know, which is where rock comes from and blues and things like that. And bass is obviously a big deal. You know, you're driving the, you're driving the rhythm section with the bass and the drums. Mm -hmm. And especially like with bands like Metallica with their records, I mean, they just tried to bury bass guitar as much as possible. And I was like, why would you do that? Mm -hmm. You know? So my feel was like, I, I, I have to go the opposite direction. I, I, I came from more of an R and B background um and i i love dub music very much and things like mm -hmm. that where where bass is very prevalent so when you look and when you listen to led zeppelin records for example yeah, you yeah. can hear every note the bass is playing and that's re it's really important because there's a lot of counterpoint in bass you know so to kind of eliminate it or to kind of stick it way in the background is to me it's kind of silly i mean you're missing all this beautiful like movement and you know, and again, like counterpoint against vocal melody, because if you're in a rock band, you can't really, you, you don't have a lot of, exp there aren't a lot of opportunities to experiment with counterpoint without interfering with the guitar, with interfering with the vocal, because the only instrument you have apart from bass to do counterpoint would be a guitar, mm -hmm. you know, and you could be playing the vocalist range. So to me, the rhythm section sound was going to be important on this record. Um, I found a rack of old Neve modules that no one had ever heard of before, these 1057s, which were Germanian, had Germanium transistors in them, hmm. as opposed to 1073s, which had silicon transistors. And they featured heavily in the drum sound on this record. Um, they just added this punch and this presence that I'd never really heard before. You know, and I spent a lot of time getting a drum sound on that record. And the band were not happy about that either. Really? And they... 
if you look on their Wikipedia page, in the Wikipedia page for the record, and you see Chris complaining about how anally retentive I was about getting sounds <laughs> on the record, that's really where it started. And I don't think that they were prepared for that either. Hmm. Um, we, we hadn't really, of course, we hadn't gotten into, we never had a conversation about aesthetics or anything like that before the, the record began. So, you know, uh, they didn't know what they were in for. But, you know, all of a sudden here I am fiddling around with microphones and EQs and this thing and that thing and, you know, this drum head, that drum head and, you know, and and the engineer, Jason Corsaro, I think that he had hoped that we were going to do this record really fast. I think he wanted, he, his idea was to make like a three microphone setup and be done. And it, for me, it's just, you know, as many mics as we can get out there. I, you know, I wanted det- a lot of detail on everything. And he didn't like that very much either. <laughs> I mean, he went along with it grudgingly. He certainly contributed to it as well. Um, he had some added some very important contributions. I mean, we had a pair of overhead U67 microphones that was that that really helped us sound a great deal. But originally, that was going to be part of his drum sound, like two overheads, one kick drum mic, gotcha. and boom. And I was like, yeah, I was like, okay, that's great. We're going to add those to all the other mics. And he was like. Oh no! Wait a minute. <laughs> That's funny. So we got this, we got this drum sound after about like five or six days, and the band were kind of like, we could have cut all the drum tracks in these past five or six days. I mean, they were really pissed off at that point. But I was like, you know, I, I realized that I was not making myself very popular. But you know, I looked at the record and I was like, look, this is you guys' shot. You know, mm-hmm. you've hired me to do a job, right? And if you, you know, if you, you're hiring me to do this job, I'm going to do it the best way I see fit. I'd like you to have something that you're going to not only be able to live with, but it's going to actually be relevant to you in like 20 years or something like that. Mm-hmm. You know, that's going to be meaningful and that, that will be long lasting, maybe outlast all of us if we're really lucky. You know, so I just kind of stuck to my guns on it. So, you know, you said now that you kind of stuck to your guns. You wanted to get this record done right so it would last as long as it can and certainly you succeeded in that you know super unknown is one is is their biggest record one of the biggest records from the 90s period when that record really took off what was your reaction to it did you expect that success or like how did you what was your reaction i didn't really know what to expect Hmm. uh i knew that at least one of the songs on the record was going to be very very well received I felt that there were a bunch of other songs on the record that could do that, that could be received well also, but I knew that Black Hole Sun was that was going to, you know, really turn people's heads. Uh, I had no idea how well it was going to do. I, it just wasn't really in my, um, it wasn't in my purview. Like I, I didn't, I, I didn't think like that so much. I just wanted to make the best record that I could with these guys because. I wanted to make sure that they had something that would sustain their careers and would also have some some duration to it, some longevity. Mm-hmm. And so you mentioned now that uh, at a certain point, things started to get you know a little bit tense with the guys because you kept pressing to get certain things on a certain way. Uh, from what I understand, you recorded the record from July to September of 93. At what point did that start to happen, that kind of tension? Was it later on? Like how early did that start? The tension? Not necessarily tension. It might be the wrong um, word. The uh, like the the conflict of let's just move on, no, let's stay. Oh no, it was no, it was tense. I, no, I mean tension is 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 the right is definitely the right word. I mean it kind of happened before we went into the studio. Um, I think Matt started to get kind of disenchanted with working with me early on. Um, it might have had something to do with the fact that I I told the guys that I felt that they needed to have more material for the record. Um, I, I was never really sure. And, you know, then I come in and instead of having a drum sound in 20 minutes, it takes five days, you know, and I'm trying everything in, in the studio. Like I even brought in a digital tape machine to see if that sounded better for the drums than the analog tape mm-hmm. machines. And, you know, they, they just weren't having it. So already things were getting kind of, we're, we're getting kind of rough and you know we had an initial we had an initial break-in period where they were uncomfortable with how i was working 
And I don't think that they ever completely got used to it. Um, but I didn't get fired. <laughs> <That's good>. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get fired at any point. So I guess that they tolerated it enough. Uh, I think that even though they didn't like that, they, 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 they accepted the bed, they, they made the bed that they had to, that they had to lie in. Um, or, you know, they, they accepted the bed that they had to lie in. They didn't, they just didn't like the way the bed had been made. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But they kind of, they just, they accepted it after a while, but it was never, it was never an easy process making that record. I hear you. But sometimes you need that, that tension actually contributes to the creative energy I find when it comes to a lot of the really great records out there. Just my observation. It, it. can, mm -hmm. it, it definitely can. I mean, I'm, there isn't one aspect of this record that I'm going to look back on and go, it should have been done differently because I think the ends more than justify the means, you know, and I, I'm, I, I've never been anything less than incredibly proud of that record. And there isn't one part of it that I think should or could have been done differently. You know, again, I'm proud of that record. I'm, I'm happy to have worked with those guys. Um, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled beyond belief that it worked well, that it worked out well for them, which is all I really wanted to do. And they deserved it, you know, cause they're, they were, they're a fantastic band. And, uh, you know, and they wrote amazing songs. I mean, I can talk for days about the work that I did on it, but, you know, the record wouldn't have existed without their music and their performances. So they, they more than roast the occasion on it. Mm -hmm. You know, they did a fantastic job.